Well, I want to welcome you to our review of Behold a Red Horse. And we're going to go into the Word of God, so let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for the extremes you go to on our behalf. We do pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would attend us, open our hearts and lives to what you have here for us, that we might better understand what you would have of us in response. As we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands, in the name of our coming King, indeed. Amen. Well, behold a red horse. This is the first of two sessions. And we're going to explore actually just two verses in Revelation. But we're there, from there we'll go elsewhere. Behold a red horse. The first session will be the red horse itself, the context we're dealing with here. We'll talk a little bit about the art of war and the classic studies that support that. And we'll talk a little bit about technology trends. Because obviously, technology continues to challenge and change. In the second session, we're going to explore our immediate horizon, our current geopolitical horizon. But we're going to do it from a biblical point of view. We're not going to try to update the, 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 the uncertainties that surround us right now. We're going to fo focus on what the Bible tells us is going to happen. And so with that, let's move on here. Revelation has its own outline. And uh, Jesus tells John to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And that the first session is, he, in chapter 1, he's just seen the vision of Christ. 18 verses up till now, he's, he's already seen that. Write the things which are the seven letters to seven churches, which will follow in the next two chapters. And the things which shall be Hereafter, the word there in the Greek is metatauta. It's a, it's a flag signal. Because the first verse of chapter 4 is metatauta. In other words, th this book parses itself. And that's very helpful to really grasp that. It'll avoid you from getting into error. And to write the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which uh, will be after these things. So chapters 4 and 5 will be the saints in heaven. We'll take a glimpse of that. Then comes chapter 6 through 19, the major section of the book of Revelation is what we would call the 70th week of Daniel, in detail. And then that have six seals, six trumpets, six bowls, and so forth. And they're probably logarithmic projections, I suspect. You'll see what I see here in a minute. And we're going to zero in on chapter 6, but I think it's very important to sort of get the context of the passage as being the first few verses of chapter 6 is where we're headed here. And uh, we'll notice that there's a seven-sealed scroll that the Lord opens up. And we'll notice a pattern all through the book. There's six and then a change of subject. And then the seventh one's given. And there's a parenthetical passage between verse, uh, the sixth and seventh seal. And that, that seventh seal turns out to be seven trumpets. And again, six of the trumpets are described, and then there's a change of subject for uh, five chapters. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 are inserted there before it picks up again the seventh trumpet. Once you understand that, the whole thing starts to make more sense. It's, it's, being, it's, like, it's like a symphony, very carefully orchestrated. And then, of course, the uh, seventh trumpet issues seven bowls. But between the sixth and the seventh bowl, it's just a one-verse parenthesis, but there is a parenthesis. That structure has been preserved for some reason. And so that's interesting. And it's my personal conjecture that uh, John wrote his gospel after he had the Bat Patmos experience. Because we'll notice more subtly the same kind of structures in, uh, in his gospel. But then we get to chapter 4, verse 1, and it says, After this I looked, and behold... The word after this there is that metatauta, that same phrase in the Greek. After this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. 
and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And again, that's that metatauta, that word metatauta. And there were, in the fifth verse down, you notice the seven lamps, which in chapter one were among the churches on the earth, in chapter four, verse five, are in heaven. So you see a change of scene. If you're paying attention, you see the change of scene there. So we're in chapter four. Throne of God is the first few couple of verses. There are these 24 elders, and it's really crucial in my view to really satisfy yourself as to who they represent. And um, the kings and the priests, the redeemed. The seven lamps, as I mentioned, from chapter one are in heaven in chapter five. There's a sea of glass that they're standing on. In Ephesians, they were washing the word of God. There they're standing on it. I think that... I think the Holy Spirit is using puns, literally. And uh, then the four living creatures. Your King James says beasts, but it's unfortunate because the word beast is a different word used elsewhere. It's really the four living creatures, a little different word. But anyway, with their four faces, and there's a whole study of the four faces we won't get into here. But David, the only place you find 24 as an express number in the scripture is David's organizing the priesthood, the 24 courses of the priests in 1 Chronicles 24. Again, 24, interestingly. There are 24 identifiers in chapter 1 referring to Jesus Christ. And each one of those are used as identities throughout the rest of the book. But there's 24 of them, again. And of course, there's 24 dispensational intervals. And we talked about that in one of our previous sessions. The 24 identity codes you can track down by just looking through carefully chapter 1. And you'll find there's 24 labels that are then used to refer to Christ all through the rest of the book, 20 identity codes. And there's, of course, these 24 dispensational intervals that um, we noticed in, that in 70 weeks, uh, verse 26 is one of them, but we discover that they're actually all through the Bible, and there's 24 of them all together, and so let you look that on your own. And so, um, and in some of those places, like when Peter quotes from Psalm, he leaves out a whole phrase and uh, to, to maintain this dispensational parsing, if you will. But, okay, let's 24 elders. And fortunately for us, they identify who they are um, when they sing a song in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 5. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art speaking to the Lamb. Uh, they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and wast, hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests. That's the key word, kings and priests. Only three people are labeled that way. Melchizedek in Genesis 14, which would disappear into oblivion, except it's picked up by Psalm 110 and hammered home. And the epistle to the Hebrews spends three chapters hammering on the fact that there are three, including Melchizedek, the Messiah himself, and the redeemed. The, the us, in other words. Uh, us to God, us unto our God, and so forth. And so, and okay, then the key climax, for me at least it is, is Revelation 5, verse 1. It says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven or on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll. Neither look thereon. And we don't know what's going on, but John understood. John says, I sobbed convulsively. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the scroll and look thereon. It had to be a man. It had to, there was no man in heaven. There was no man found worthy. It had to be a kinsman of Adam. And, he, and they can't find one, so he's upset, of course. But fortunately, one of the elders, whenever something is explained to John in heaven, it's by one of the elders. If, so, if someone's explaining something that's going on on the earth, it's one of the cherubim. Interesting. One of the elders said unto me, Weep not! Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And John says, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood the Lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. That sevenfold expression of the Holy Spirit we pick up from Isaiah 11 and it echoes all through here. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, we know who he is obviously. Okay, the Lamb as it had been slain. 
It's interesting that the title here is the very title that John the Baptist introduced him publicly when he first appears publicly. John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That was a very Jewish title. But I want you to notice the sequence. It's very important as we go forward here. The 24 elders are in heaven, worshiping the Lamb before he receives the scroll with the seven seals. That's important. People miss that, but it's important. It's the Lamb that, ha that then has the unique right to open the seven seals. But he's worshiped beforehand. You follow me? It's his opening the seals that sets the four horsemen into motion. And that's a, that, it's, it's, that, it's, it may sound like I'm badgering a trivial thing. It, it's amazing how many people get confused because they don't notice that. Okay. The opening of the seven seal scroll. Revelation 6, the first few verses. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were a noise of thunder, one of the four living creatures said, Come and see. And behold, a white horse, and he said, sat on him and had a bow, and the bow crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering to conquer. That was the first one. We took that one in our previous set. The first one, a white horse, conquering. Now the second seal is a red horse, speaking of wars. And uh, he said, I opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. Notice it's the living creatures that are, that are timing these things. That's another proof that the first one is not Christ, it's a false Christ. And uh, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So that's the red horse. And horses are often used to designate judgments. We saw that in Zechariah and elsewhere. That's an idiom that's used in the scripture. So that's the two. And there's a couple more coming. The black horse, which represents famine. Opened the third seal. Heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld a low, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand, making measurements. Black is often connected with famine. To eat bread by weight is one of the things used in Leviticus and elsewhere as a phrase of, of, of shortages, if you will. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four priests say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of bar uh, barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And so that's the black horse that we'll summarize by calling him famine. There's more to it than that. We'll be taking that in our next session, not in, this, in, our, in our next session. Uh, a bit here. And then the fourth one is the livid horse. Livid, pale. The actual word is chloros in the Greek, the greenish color. Speaking of death. And then when you open the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him. And power was given over them, over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And those beasts aren't necessarily four-footed mammals. They can be microscopic viruses or whatever. We'll look at that when we get there, of course. So those are the four. And so it's interesting in Ezekiel 14, we pick up a phrase, for thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, and the pestilence, and cut off from it man and beast. Same order, echoed earlier in, in Ezekiel 14. Something else that's worth keeping in focus, these elements of Revelation 6 match the same series in Matthew 24. Here we have a white horse rider, a red horse rider, a black horse rider, a pale horse, and then martyrs and worldwide chaos. That's what's coming in chapter 6 of Revelation. When we study Matthew 24, we find the same pattern. False Christs, wars, famines, death, martyrs, and worldwide chaos. Same, echoing the same kinds of events, if you will. And something that's incidental, probably not too important, but it's interesting to notice that the same colors are in all the Islamic flags. And uh, I just... I don't know what you do with that piece of information, but it's an interesting observation. So. But we're going to focus on these seven seals. First, second, third, and fourth. The, four, the, the fabled four horsemen of the apocalypse. And, uh, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. Now, what he actually said is just the opposite. That's the way it's translated in the King James. He said, proceed. 
not come and see, but proceed. The word erku. Er, it, it's a trivial thing probably, but it's, it, it's interesting that it echoes this way. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. See, red is associated often with terror or death. There's a red dragon in chapter 12 representing Satan. And the red beast in chapter 17. A red, it's a, not, not a surprise. And he's, a sword is given to him, a chira. And that, of course, is used all through the Old Testament. But something, make a technology statement here. Yep, I'm quoting not from Revelation here, but from Matthew 24. But a verse that we should pay attention to. Matthew 24, verse 22, Jesus himself says, Except those days be sh should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And I feel it was essential to keep this in front of us as we go into this subject. This is a technology statement. If you and I were studying this a century ago, it wouldn't make sense. If we're studying this during the Civil War in the United States, you can't visualize mankind wiping himself out with muskets and bayonets. And so this, this implies uh, a technology. Now the question you might ask ourselves, did the technology to do this exist before our generation? It didn't. We live in a generation where it's literally not only possible, but threatened. Every geopolitical decision on the planet Earth has the nuclear cloud hanging over it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And this wouldn't make sense if it was Civil War times with Be or any of the earlier stages with, with manual, you didn't, couldn't see man, you see some awful carnage, yes, but not wiping him totally, self out totally. And yet that is the thing that sits there. So we're going to talk a little bit about the art of a war. Now that may sound strange because most of us have an intrinsic focus on being peacemakers. The idea art, art of war sounds negative. And that's, that's, a, that's a myopia on our part. Through most of man's history, men's skill at warfare was essential to protect themselves and their families and their communities and their countries from, from enemies. It was a noble profession. One could argue the most noble profession. No greater love than he that will lay down his his life for his friends. So the art of war is not something to be disparaged. In fact, societies punish themselves when they fail to maintain skills in their leadership to deal with threats. And so the art of war, it's actually, there's a number of classics. It's interesting, uh, it, the, the number of real classics in this area are well known and relatively limited. And uh, Sun Tzu is perhaps the granddaddy of them all. The Art of War, written 500 B.C. approximately. Karl von Clausewitz, from Kriegi, or from war, back in the 19th century. Elliot Richardson, this is one you probably haven't run into unless you've been involved in negotiating um, treaties and things of this kind. Richardson's famous, The Statistics of Deadly Quarrels, a mathematical treatment that became very, very famous in the early part of the 20th century. Herman Kahn's book was a monumental book on thermonuclear war in 1960. And I'm going to use James Dale Davidson and Lord Riesmug's summary of an overview as we go forward here. But we're going to contrast, I'm going to just, I've just picked this few classics to be a sample. Um, we'll contrast this with the ultimate classic, and that's the Holy Bible, and we'll do that in the next session. We'll focus on it there. But Sun Tzu's Art of War. Siam Khan recounted that China's first historical emperor, Qin Shi's Huang Ti, considered the book invaluable in ending the, t the time of warring states. In the 20th century, the Chinese communist leader Mao Zedong partially credited his 1949 victory over Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang with this book. It, 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 they felt it was pivotal. 
That work strongly influenced Mao's writings about guerrilla warfare, which further influenced all the communist insurgencies around the world. The Art of War was introduced to Japan in about 760, and but quickly became popular among Japanese generals. It certainly affected the unification of Japan in the early modern era. Strange, this book did. Prior to the Meiji Restoration, mastery of its teachings was honored among the samurai, and its teachings were both exhorted and exemplified by the influential daimo and shoguns. It remained popular among the imperial Japanese uh, armed forces in, in World War II. The admiral of the fleet, Togo Haichichiro, who led Japan's forces to victory in the Russo-Japanese War, was an avid reader of Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu's Art of War. Ho Chi Minh translated the work for his Vietnamese officers to study. His general, the strategist behind the victories over the French and American forces in Vietnam, was likewise an avid student and practitioner of these ideas. America's Asian conflicts against Japan, North Korea, and North Vietnam brought Sun Tzu to the attention of the American military leaders. The U.S. Department of the Army has directed all units to maintain libraries within their respective headquarters for the continuing education personnel, the art of war. And uh, his art of war was listed in the Marine Corps' professional reading program. And during the Gulf War in the 90s, General Norman <laughs> Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell acknowledged principles from Sun Tzu related to the deception, speed, and striking of one's enemy's weak points. So this is a classic, as that, as that old that's become a classic in all, in all the sense of that word. Mark McNeely summarizes, he says, a modern interpretation of Sun and his importance throughout Chinese history is critical in understanding China's push to becoming a superpower in the 21st century. Modern Chinese scholars explicitly rely on historical strategic lessons and the art of war in developing their theories, seeing a direct relationship between their modern struggles and those of China in Sun Tzu's time. And there's a great perceived value in Sun Tzu's teachings and other tra traditional Chinese writers, which are used regularly in developing the strategies of Chinese state and its leaders. You may say I'm emphasizing this too much. Anyone that's been to West Point or Annapolis Naval Academy will, I think, testify to the value of having a depth of heritage in these areas. And this is going to be tested because we've foolishly thrown that to the dogs. We've really uh, rooted out the, the heritage part of both the major, major academies. I think it's a big mistake. Another cat classic work is uh, Carl Philip Gottfried von Klauschewitz, a Prussian general and military theorist who stressed the moral, psychological, and political aspects of war. One of the big mistakes that Hitler made, he inherited the German general staff, which represented many generations of specialists in military science. Prussia was not effective agriculturally, so its primary skill uh, developed was in military, military tactics and so forth. They had a deep, deep history and insight. And the German general staff was something to be respected and feared. And Hitler made the big mistake of ignoring them. And uh, that's to our benefit. He, was, he didn't trust them and he set up his own clowns. Uh, that's another whole part of it. But, but anyway, the, it's interesting to realize the depth of learning that was represented generations of it in that staff that they didn't take advantage of. Now, uh, Clausewitz's most notable work was von Krivi, but there's others. He stressed the dialectical interaction of diverse factors, noting how unexpected developments unfolding under the fog of war, as he called it, in the face of incomplete, dubious, and often completely erroneous information and high levels of fear, doubt, and excitement, call for rapid decisions by alert commanders. And it's a very contemporary treating, uh, uh, treatment. And uh, he saw history as a vital check on the erudite abstractions that did not accord with experience. Boy, he argued that war could not be quantified or reduced to map work, geometry, or graphs. And uh, Clausewitz had many aphorisms, of which the most famous is, war is the continuation of politics by other means. <laughs> 
War is the continuation of politics by other means. I like that. There's another book you probably have not heard of unless you've been in the, in the field, and that's Richardson's Statistics of Deadly Quarrels. And this was a, a, a late uh, 19th, er, uh, 19th century. He was an English mathematician, physicist, a meteorologist primarily, a psychologist, pacifist, who pioneered modern mathematical techniques of weather forecasting and application of similar techniques to studying the causes of wars and how to prevent them, interestingly enough. He's also, as a mathematician, known for his pioneering work in, uh, concerning fractals and methods of solving linear equations, known as the Richardson's interaction. But uh, he applied his mathematical skills to understanding the basis of international conflict. For this reason, he now is considered the initiator of scientific analysis of conflict, an interdisciplinary topic of quantitative and mathematical social science dedicated to systematic investigation of the causes of war and conditions of, spe of peace. And as he'd done in meteorology, he analyzed war using mainly differential equations and probability theory. So if you picked up his book, you'd quickly just cast it aside unless you have an appetite for those things. But considering the armament of two nations, Richardson posited an idealized system of equations whereby the rate of a nation's armament buildup is directly proportional to the amount of its arms the rival has, the grievances felt toward the rival, and it's negatively proportional to the amount of arms he already has itself. He actually quantified those things and came up with models that are uh, uh, regarded as very useful. And uh, solutions of the system equations allows insightful conclusions to be made regarding the nature and the stability or instability of various hypothetical conditions which might obtain between nations. And one of the jobs I had when I was in that world was to, I designed the war games supporting the Geneva negotiations for the arms control negotiations. And setting up a situation where there is an imbalance between two is always unstable. We dem actually demonstrated that empirically. It's really quite really leaning heavily on Richardson's ideas. He presented data on virtually every war from 1815 to 1945. He hypothesized a 10 logarithmic scale for conflicts. In other words, there were many more small fights in which only a few people die than large ones that kill many. And while no, no Conflict size can be predicted beforehand. Indeed, it's impossible to give an upper limit to the series. Overall, they do form a Poisson distribution, and that's useful. And on a smaller scale, he also showed the same pattern for gang murders in Chicago and Shanghai, if that means anything. <laughs> anyway, one of my favorites, though, is Herman Kahn, because I had a chance to meet him. Uh, he was a military strategist at the Rand Corporation, and although his ma major work was written only a year before he left Rand to form his own Hudson Institute, it became a foundational treatise on both the nature and theory of war in, ther in the thermonuclear age. And it's a very different kind of thing. Thinking about the unthinkable was one of the major chapters. Kahn, big thick book, absolutely required reading to anyone that's in the strategic world. Kahn addressed the strategic doctrines of nuclear war and its effect on the international balance of power. He introduced the concept, a rhetorical device, called the dooms doomsday machine, to show the limits of John von Neumann's strategy of mutually assured destruction. And uh, widely read on both sides of the Iron Curtain, it became noteworthy for its views on the lack of credibility of a purely thermonuclear deterrent and whether a country could even win a nuclear war. Those are open questions, serious ones. But to get a broader picture, just to stand back, I used uh, Davidson and Rees Moog's summary for uh, uh, the technological impacts of war through history. Wars changed. National governments rose to the, due to the economy of scale and violence. Gunpowder is what created nation states and, uh, in the 16th, 17th centuries. Since then, there's been a systematic increase in incidence and severity of wars and armies increase with size. Mercenary forces of the 16th, 17th seldom surpassed 20 to 30,000. By the 17th century, nationalized armies doubled and tripled in size. Napoleon mobilized about a million, unheard of before then. In the 17th century, there was rarely one artillery piece for every thousand armed men. By 1709, there were usually two or three. By 1916, the French massed 2,000 guns in 10 kilometers of front. By 1942, in Stalingrad, the Russians assembled 4,000 guns in just four kilometers. See the intensity of the technology. 
In the 18th century, the average size of the large field army was about 47,000. In the U.S. Civil War, the Federal Army reached a maximum size of about over 600,000. In World War I, over 63 million men were mobilized and at least 8.5 million killed. See these things escalating. As the technology improves, the economies of scale get worse. In World War II, the total mobilized was about 100, over 100 million people. And the battle casualties here do not include over 100 million killed by Stalin or Hitler in death camps of their own people, which is a whole other subject in a sense. World War I conflict domains remained historically limited and they were territorial. Even World War I was territorial. World War II introduced the global conflict. That changed the scale of everything. Current strategic horizon involves what we call triads, land-based missiles, uh, submarine missiles, and bombers. In other words, all three uh, elements. World War III will certainly involve space assets. They already are, incidentally. 20th century was known as the American, listed as the American century of Henry Luce back in 41. Very accurate description. It's also been de uh, deemed the bloodiest century in all of human history. 20th century is the bloodiest we've ever had. And we're now in the 21st. So you can get your coiffal Esther log with your paper and draw some lines and predict how bad it's going to be. The final confrontation will certainly be hyperdimensional. Because that opens up a whole other subject. General Douglas MacArthur and President Reagan both so declared in public statements, expecting involvements of aliens, strangely enough. Wars and other prophetic events always seem to come in spurts, incidentally, the increasingly in, with increasing intensity like birth pangs, the very word that Matthew uses. Technology has accelerated confrontations. Battles, by the way, are won or lost in advance, usually on the drawing board just several years ago. The Association of the Old Crows, those are your, all your countermeasures people, still bandages, have their re re reunions. Electronic countermeasures are the key technology even, ever more than ever today. In the movie Top Gun, <laughs> the key engagement lasted three minutes. Three, minute, three minutes for the whole deal. Today, standing armies, professional military, heritage and traditions, all have been prostituted in our current administrations. Where Michael knew he was court-martialed because he refused to shed his American uniform. He refused the UN uniform. He'd do whatever they asked, but he's going to do it as an American soldier. They court-martialed him. And the Congress was... To, uh, how to, didn't fail to act, unfortunately. Now we have also strategic weapons. What I mean, atomic bombs themselves involve a point target. A thermonuclear is an area that, 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 that's what changed everything. The thermonuclear allows you to move the decimal point. There's another thing called electromagnetic pulse. There are things called neutron bombs, biological weapons, these are all exacerbated by the advent of inexpensive chemical biological weapons and the deniability of the companies as small rogue terrorist groups. Up till now, it's been economies of scale, not anymore. Small groups with modest funding can create havoc, total havoc. So the nature of modern conflicts is changing. The ground, a ground blast of a relatively small one megaton bomb hitting a city of about a million people would leave almost half injured, one fourth of the buildings unusable. A standard four megaton bomb, that's our standard military one, it's not one, it's four, four megaton bomb, would leave a 30 mile crater in which even the building materials would be unidentifiable. It would have been ionized. That's your standard four megaton weapon. Intercontinental missiles can reach anywhere in the world in less than the time of this talk. And the casualties of a full-scale exchange have been estimated at about half the population involved. Now, the Soviet doctrine, they, it plans to take advantage of surprise. Their doctrines are based on a first-strike assumption. And that's not a supposition. I've had that from the JCS itself. We know that as their philosophy. 
The U.S. policy is to endure a first strike. That's what I'd call reckless endangerment of the American people. For a deterrent to be effective, it has to be credible. And, and that's more than just the technical assessment of the systems involved. It's, it includes the credibility of the decision maker. And brinksmanship confrontations have already occurred in more frequency than they, they want you to know. The most well-known, of course, the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis is well-known, well-documented. But there have been many other times. At NORAD, there was an alert right up to, we were less than 10 minutes away from an exchange. Man tells us the world's getting better. God says they're going to get worse and worse and worse. Man says that peace among the nations is close at hand. I don't believe it. God says there'll be wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdoms. Man expects to win the battle against disease, famine, and hardship. Seems fair enough. God says there's going to be fearful judgments of disease, famine, and hardship. So I'm not bringing good news here. So the red horse, let's talk a little bit about technology trends. From here, we could go into a whole side discussion of transhumanism. Right now, as we speak, the biggest arms race that we've ever had going on is going on between Russia, China, and the US to build what they call the super soldier. All the technologies, and there's a handful of them, not, uh, not only genetics, um, robotics, um, nanotechnology, the goal of which is to make machines the size of molecules, and uh, artificial intelligence are all being, all accelerating at enormous speeds, all aimed at, among other things, creating the super soldier. And not just exoskeletons that you can run up a hill with AIDS, much more than that. They now can make muscles with 100 to 1. They don't use they don't, they, they don't have to use hydraulics anymore. They, can, they actually have muscles that are 100 to 1 better that can be mustered in. So we could spend a whole hour just highlighting some of those things. And we have. We, could, we have materials on the transhumanism. All that applies here. Stealth, the other technology trend is to make things invisible to radar. The fact that we have stealth fighters and bombers is no surprise. It may surprise you know we also have stealth techniques that make them invisible to lasers. And uh, these are both airborne and ground and uh, very sensitive areas. But that leads to another trend that deserves more discussion. The whole idea of rob wars among ro robots. Did you know that they've already started? Did you know that we have several hundred robot aircraft in Afghanistan that are being piloted from Langley, Virginia, or Florida. Predators, as they're called, is the, one of the brands that's turned out to be very successful, uh, under remote control. There are even some that can be launched from aircraft and regathered by aircraft. Robo Wars. Predator robots in Afghanistan are currently being piloted from Langley, Virginia, and Florida. Stealth bombers also are now remotely piloted from aircraft carriers. Surprised me to discover this. Drones is the popular term for them, are now able to be launched from airborne carriers and then retrieved after their missions airborne. I didn't realize that. So the most successful one is a very simple one called the Predator. No pilots on board. It has a team that helps get it off the ground and it uh, has long endurance not high performance in the usual sense of the term, and uh, incredibly successful. And uh, these things are piloted remotely over the internet from another location, typically Langley, Virginia, or Florida, a, a base for that. They don't have to be. They now have, have uh, travel packages that they can drop. That is, the whole, the whole uh, control room is in a transshipable module. And uh, so, and they don't just gather information. They can, but they also can launch missiles. They actually can, the team that's controlling these things can see the ground, they can spot and confirm their target and execute it. And do, already. Um, astonishing. 
And some of these are going to more advanced versions. All the way around, the whole thing is escalating in its sophistication. And uh, so, and there's stealth versions of these that are carrier based. And uh, these are all non piloted aircraft. A different world coming, a world of ro robot wars. And we're not the only ones doing it. This is the Gijou Soar Dragon, about a 750 kilometers per hour cruise speed, about 7,000 kilometer range, 2,000 kilometer combat range, endurance about 10 hours, service ceiling about 18,000 meters, and uh, thrust to weight is incredible, almost six. So that uh, doesn't have a pilot on board. All done remotely. Different world coming. Different kind of world. A world that I'm going to suggest is more hazardous than it's been before. Not for the pilots, because they're not on the board. But there's some, there's some other trends. So in all these trends, something else is going on. That's what I'm going to call the reversal of the economies of scale. One of the things is miniaturization. One of the big things in nuclear weapons now is make them small. Something you can carry in your pocket or in a suitcase. That's, that's the cutting edge of that world. And there's 185 suitcase nukes that are missing from inventory, by the way. Interesting little stack. fact, I'm all over. But the other thing is being overlooked, which is an offset, in my mind, to the robot wars. Electromagnetic pulse technology. And this is not a new surprise, but it's just being ignored astonishingly. Let's talk about this a little bit. Electromagnetic pulse. You know, the engineers, not only can they not spell, they can't even parse a word properly. Electromagnetic pulse, you'd think, is two words, but it's three letters. It's EMP. That's just, if you're an engineer, it makes sense. If it's, electromagnetic pulse. It's the nemesis of our electronic world. The more we advance technologically, the more vulnerable we become to EMP. What are we doing? And when we talk about EMP, let's first of all talk about the nuclear threat. There's another one I'll come to. In 1962, we detonated some routine atomic tests, and the Starfish Prime detonation was done about 400 kilometers above Johnston Island. It was an airborne um, uh, ignition. It was about 1,400 kilometers away from Hawaii. Seems safe enough, a long way away, did a little test, what harm can it be? This, it caused the street lights in Hawaii to fail. That shocked a lot of, a lot of people gotten, couldn't figure out what was going on. Tripping alarms, circuit breakers, so forth. 1,400 kilometers away. They damaged telecommunication facilities. A lot of explanations going, a lot of careers cracked up because no one was aware of the phenomenon at that time. The Soviets also, we were doing the Starfish Prime detonation, the Soviets were also doing their tests, what they called Project K. They discovered the same thing, that they had power breakdowns of buried cables that failed. And they damaged the overhead and buried cables 600 kilometers away. And that's when they started to investigate to figure what on earth is going on. It's a comp very complex amount of physics. It's actually a three-stage st three thing that occurs if the, if the um, detonation is in high altitude. Now, I won't go through that. It's not important to us. It all happens in less than a mic microsecond. But we did, as a result of all of that, impanel a commission to assess the threat to the United States from the electromagnetic pulse attack. This was done in 2008. And it had the top guys that we could corral for this day. William Graham himself was the chairman, John Foster. And the whole list here is, is the blue ribbon list of our best minds that were impaneled to evaluate this thing. And their publication is on the internet. You can read it. It's quite readable. You'll want to read it because it'll be disturbing. Uh, one of the things they concluded, for example, that an EMP prevents you 
from establishing a recovery plan. If you're going to have a recovery plan, you need to have it in place before the EMP lands as an insight. Sounds simple, but it's profound in its implications. Okay. Our vulnerability. You know, Israel is known as a one bomb target. You can have one nuke over Tel Aviv, it's over. Did you know the United States is also a one bomb target? That may come as a surprise. If you were an adver adversary to the United States, and you could get your hands on a nominal, a nominal nuclear warhead. What would you do with it? Well, I'd park it down midtown Manhattan at rush hour or something. Nonsense. Nonsense. You know what the most dangerous thing you could do with that? Is to put it in an off-the-shelf intermediate-range ballistic missile, not a big one, and launch it into the sky. Accuracy won't matter, altitude does. And if you get it high enough, you can eliminate the United States for all practical purposes. Just one bomb delivered at high altitude could plunge the United States back to the 19th century. No power, no phones, no water, no transportation, no batteries, car batteries won't work anymore. No telecommunications. Can you imagine this without? I don't mean for a few hours. I mean none. No power. Not just for a few hours or days. Gone. Transformers burned out. No water, food, sanitation in major cities. How long would that last? No law enforcement. Can you imagine? Have you noticed the rise of crime during Katrina, some of these, it's amazing how quickly the looters start. An interesting observation by the panel was that no recovery plan could then be installed. Your, any recovery plan has to be in place before it happens. Because you lose the ability to put it, a, pla a plan in place. You got chaos right over right now, overnight. How do you get an ambulance to the hospital if the traffic is jammed because the signals aren't working? How do you get that? How do you get? You can't, you can't fix that. Signals aren't working, there's a traffic jam. What do you do about it? That's one thing we learned in just Katrina. What will prevent the looting and, and cri other crimes of violence? Law enforcement will be ineffectual. How do you get food to the stores if the trucks aren't working? If you're in a metropolitan area, you're dependent on the trucks like, and traffic and all that. How do you cope with no phones? None. No power, no water. The EMP Commission estimated that within 12 months of a nationwide blackout, up to 90% of the US population could possibly perish from starvation, disease, and societal breakdown. That's their conclusion. You don't think this sounds a little weird? You can Google at your leisure this report, which was published in 2008 and is still on the internet for you to read. Or you can read the one that they did last year. They revised it, did it again, trying to get Congress to wake up and take action. Nothing has happened. A lot of talk. Oh my goodness, it's urgent. We really need to do something about this, but nothing has been done. None. Zero. And by the way, see, you don't have to get the whole United States. Ideally, theoretically, if you're playing this, you'd like to just drop a nuke high enough right over the middle of the United States. You get the whole thing. Don't need to. You'd get a container ship and you keep it in international waters 200 miles offshore. And you can buy a container that will pop open and launch a missile, by the way. They're an off-the-shelf item, believe it or not. It costs about 40 grand. So from that container ship, you, lo you launch a standard off-the-shelf intermediate range ballistic missile. Not the fancy ones. Accuracy doesn't matter. Altitude does. So you, you manage to get that thing off and you don't make it to the middle. You make it to maybe Cincinnati or maybe Indianapolis, right? And you, what you may not realize is that covers 70% of the population. 
The way you get that perspective is to take a look at it at night. Off-the-shelf warhead launched an off-the-shelf medium-range missile, 200 miles from offshore. Accuracy doesn't matter. Attitude does. Let's, let's assume you could reach Cincinnati or maybe Indianapolis. 70% of the population. Look at the United States at night. You get a feeling for population density. You see what happens? That ring covers most of them. 70% is a good guess. Now, I'm not pushing that. Don't misunderstand me. But I want to put this is something that a small group with a, with a little bit of financing can pull off. Because these, these, these nukes are available. They're on the black market. And, I, and, and to pull those resources together isn't far-fetched. This isn't the plot of a Clancy novel. It's a reality that's operative day to day. Interesting stuff. Several congressional commissions have confirmed the vulnerability and, and requested responses. But no urgency has resulted to any of this. I call this reckless endangerment of the population. Our, our, the people that are accountable to us have taken no action. No one's gotten concerned enough to rattle the right cages. Again, you can Google the commissioner assessed the threat to the United States from electromagnetic pulse, and you can do that whether you're not in the United States. You can, anyone can Google this. And there's two, there's two. The one in 2008, it happened to publish the same month that the uh, 911 thing got published, and so that, that's what the press picked up. They didn't bother with this that much. But uh, they did, a, the commission was reassembled and re readdressed the whole thing in 2014, last year. And screaming for someone to take some action. Do you realize it's the number one threat of the Department of Homeland Security in the United States is an electromagnetic pulse? Now, the military have taken action. All kinds of military stuff has some certain, certain kinds of protection. But not the metropolitan area of cities. There's nothing, no way to help. Now, if that was all, that would be all. But there's, you don't have to have a nuke to have an EMP. It turns out there's some other technologies emerging that will accomplish virtually the same thing without the sophistication of a nuclear driver of it. Directed energy applications. Now we're moving into very delicate waters here, but there have been some intercepted email among Russian officers that were talking about um, the Ukraine. One of the officers was laughing because someone said the U.S. had invaded, you know, that the Russians had invaded Ukraine. He says to his friend, he says, if we, were investing, invade, invade, if we were invading Ukraine, you would know it because none of the batteries would have be working. Car batteries would all be immediately unusable. And he went on to describe weapons effect for a directed energy form of EMP in, in a portable form. So there are apparently portable, flexible alternatives claimed in ways that we can't easily confirm. And ITAR would prevent us from doing it anyway. There's even t some studies that I don't know how to take seriously, but there's some studies that attribute some of the Twin Tower problems to directed energy. So there are technologies apparently starting to surface that are EMP, not necessarily nuclear. So. Now, the thing is, I try to think through the, the form of warfare that's emerging on our horizon. The offset to the appeal of robot wars is our increasing dependency on electronic communications all forms. On the one hand, the ability to have robot fighters fight our battles for us sounds pretty appealing in one sense, except what that's doing is making us increasingly dependent on telecommunications, which they obviously heavily depend on for their own navigation and their own controls and all the rest of it. And uh, so 
I have to tell you candidly, I worry more about Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 6 than I do about electromagnetic pulses. I've been worried about electromagnetic pulses for several decades. You've seen it in my mater our materials. This is not new news to you. But I, there's, there's another threat that I think is, to me, more telling and more imminent than that one. And uh, you'll quickly discover why I prefer the Southern Hemisphere for a number of reasons. <laughs> That's your sure protection against EMP, is being in be another hemisphere. But uh, so one of the things we like to do in these briefings would be to speculate a little bit on the present predicaments currently visible on our own geopolitical horizons. Very tempting to go through a little checklist on uh, the Middle East, on ISIS, on the Ukraine, on North Korea, um, and other, uh, and, and, and other uh, combatant possibilities in the China Sea and the rest. There's a list of about 10 of those that were published by the CFR. And when you go through that list, they're all very indefinite. They're none of them directly related, and yet it's generally agreed that if any one of them boils over, they all will, because they have interconnections of various kinds. And so rather than spend our energies going through a list that will be obsolete in a few months, let alone a year or two, um, there's a much better way we can go. And that is, let's see what the Bible says is coming, rather than speculate on what our latest intelligence resources seem to highlight. So that's what we're going to do in session two. So let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you that we are in the palm of your hand. And we recognize, Father, the safest place to be is right in the middle of your plan for us. So that's the plan we seek, Father, to understand more clearly than ever precisely what it is that you would have of each of us in the days ahead, that we could be effective for your purposes, whatever they might be for us in the, in the days ahead, that we might be more effective for you, more effective for the in dealing with the opportunities that you bring across our path, that would be ever more effective at declaring the coming King we serve. Help us, Father, through your Word and through your Spirit, to be ever more responsive to your will in our lives as we commit our way and all that we have into your hands. In the name of our coming King indeed, amen.